what's up? How y'all doing today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we gonna get started real quick because we got a packed show full of a lot of beautiful blackness, which is what I love, right? So we got Titi Leo Bidiaco has designed a beautiful show with some of her peers, some of my elders, some people that I've grown up listening to and learning from throughout the years. Um, we've got Elder Jossie Johnson in the house. We've got Elder Retha King in the house. And we also have Professor Mahmoud El Khati in the house. So when I was invited here, I'm, I'm filling some big shoes today. Y'all see me? Y'all see me? I, I don't quite look as fly as Nakima and Marquise, but I'm up here, right? I'm up here. So they were off on a vacation, chilling in the warmth minding their business, and they didn't expect to be getting back today. So they assigned me the job of emceeing the show. And I know they were scared, they were worried, and trust me, I have planned exactly what they were worried about. I'm giving the kids the mic today. So there will be some children here, beautiful children from We Win Institute, that will be introducing our elders. Um, it'll be beautiful, we've got some drums, some African dance, um, I'm just honored to be here. When I got to Central, thank you. By the way, I'm Chantel Allen, in case y'all didn't know. I think I should introduce myself. I'm not Nikita or Marquise. Um, when I first got to Central High School, uh, I was coming out of Ramsey Middle School, so my hands was full. I had had a lot of fun in middle school. I was looking forward to having a lot of fun at Central, and I did. Um, but I remember my very first Black History Month. Uh, Katie McGuat, who was a, a hero in our community, um, said, grabbed me out the hallway, actually, and said, come down here, you gotta see this. And so I followed her, because she usually has some good stuff for us. And I followed her down there, and there was Professor Mahmoud El Khati. That was the first time I laid eyes on him. And some of the things that he was just saying resonated in my soul in a way that I had never felt before. And I said, now see, this is what I want to learn about. And so every day, Miss McGuire would throw me a Maya Angelou book. She'd throw me a Richard Wright book when I was done with that, throw me some Malcolm X when I was done with that, until I started to generate these ideas and talk about what I understood about our blackness. And so then she would sit with me and we would talk and we would start to think about how we can change things and what the power of change can do. And that's a lot of what I carry in me right now. Year after year, I continue to run into Professor Mahmoud El Khati. I then graduated high school and ended up at MCTC and I'm just walking through the hallways and there was a big crowd of youth standing in the atrium. And behind that crowd of youth was Professor Mahmoud El Khati again. And there I was catching him again. And in my early adult life, he was on the cable network channel. And so I would tune in to channel 14. How many people watch channel 13, 14, 15? Right, right, it's crazy, right? Me, I tuned in, because Professor was on there regularly. And I continued to ingest that on a regular basis. Even in my later adult life, I know y'all's like, how old are you? I am older. <laughs> I was still able to continue to find Professor Mahmoud El Khati in so many different spaces. He does a program called Old School, New School at the High School Recording Arts where he brings new philosophers in contact with old philosophers so that we can talk about some of the things that we need to do. I showed up there. When the Heritage Tea House opened, it's a black owned business, right? Professor Mahmoud El Khati was there on a very regular basis every other day. And so I was able to sit at his feet and listen to him talk and tell him what I think about blackness so he could tell me what I needed to know about blackness. <laughs> and I loved it. And I am so honored today to be able to say that I carry a good chunk of Professor Mahmoud El Khati in my soul right alongside Katie McGuire as who I am. And so I, I wanted to share that with y'all. And so when Nakima said, you want to MC, what are we going to do on Black History Month? I was like, Professor? 
<laughs> you know, and so then that started. We invited TT in. She got, she was like, we can get better than that. We can bring more geniuses to the space. So here we are with Elder Jossie and Elder King in the space. And we have a beautiful show for you all. So I want to thank you all for coming here. Give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. We have a young, beautiful sister that's about to come bless this stage real quick with the Black National Anthem. So if you could all stand while she gets it. Shavonda Brown. Yeah. I told her I was just going to call her that because I couldn't name, you know. <laughs> My name is Shavonda Brown. I am an actress, um, a teaching artist, you know, um, writer, and this song is my favorite song, a song that I teach uh, to the youth and I educate them and tell them this song has been taught to school children for about a hundred years, and that it's an affirmation, that these are words of power and resilience um, and encouragement and of inspiration for us to keep going in our fight for liberation. So we open with this as we um, have in the past in ritual. Thank you for standing. You can sing with me or you can listen. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory to introduce and bring to the stage uh, Elder Titilayo Bidi Dako, uh, our elder and director of We Win Institute that has been running strong for two decades? <laughs> two decades for 20 years. Um, plus years, I think, I believe, um, educating the youth. So um, an elder that I look up to very much within community. Um, Passing the torch to the youth, educating the youth. If you would all give her a round of applause. Bargani, everybody, welcome. We are so excited to be here. I'm Titi Layo Bidiaco, and I'm the executive director of We Win Institute. Our mission is the academic and social success of all children. And I want you to know that I grew up in Minnesota, and I want you to know that these three have been my heroes and sheroes for a long time. And when I grew up in Minneapolis, we didn't learn about anything black. I want you to know, and as a matter of fact, they worked as hard as they could in terms of trying to steal our blackness from us and work as hard as they could in terms of making us other than who we were. Fortunately for me, I grew up with a father who was part of changing that trajectory, of which you'll hear about a little later. And so when I left Minnesota, I left Minnesota when I was 18. And I left and I went south. And when I left, 
I had such a hate for white people. And so I went down south and I went from an all white situation to an all black situation. I lived in Mississippi and Tennessee and Georgia. And what happened to me was I became a student of my own history. And the more I learned about myself and the greatness of my people, I learned that it wasn't white people that I hated, but that I had had a hate for myself. But that when I learned about my history, when I learned about my culture, I began to love me. And when I loved me, it allowed me to love all of humanity. And this is what we win works on every single day in relationship to our children. We work in terms of helping our children have a love for themselves and a love for their people. And several years ago, when we were doing programs at Olson Middle School, we um, honored Sister Josie Johnson. And so our children wrote about her and learned about her. And one of our children came up to me and said, Miss Titi, I thought all our leaders were dead. And I said, wow, that's deep. I said, so we're, we're missing something. And that not only do our, not only are not all of our leaders dead, but all our leaders don't live other places than Minnesota. So what you're going to experience tonight is the greatness of black leadership in Minnesota. And we are so honored to have so many of them here tonight. And so we're going to start out with our children, and they're going to do a little drum for us. presentation and I thought that all I had to do was click this thing and it would just magically show up <laughs> and it didn't happen but the, 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 the visuals are important so I'm just gonna wait a second so 
uh, Nakima is going to help it. Who's it making the magic happen? <laughs> Doing that, let's call up Pastor Malachi. Let's call up Pastor Malachi, even though he's in the slide presentation too. Come on up, Pastor Malachi. So Malachi usually spits some real dope uh, spoken word for us, and so I just wanted you guys to know that this is a young pastor brother leading people in the right direction, and also displaying his art at the same time. So take this in, carry it with you. Thank you. A poem to myself at the end of a good day. Sometimes we can be our own superheroes. Sometimes I'm mine. You see, I'm doing just fine because like three years ago, I was three weeks away from being homeless again. And now I'm here. The old saints used to say, I don't look like what I've been through. And trust me, I've been through. Life has hit me with some punches, but I never fell off my feet. And some folks might be faster than others, but one foot in the right direction will get us all there just the same. I ain't in no rush. I wrote this on a day that I feel good about myself, on a day when I can see the light. I'm proud of me. I serve God, I love people, and I never back down from anything that matters. I love the world with all I got, and it has made me the opposite of rich. But that's all right, because Jesus never made a dime. And for the crowd that hears this, I hope you enjoy, but Laquan, Shabazz, Malachi, this one is for you. You are good people. We're still working on technology. We got it. Shalom, you ready? Who's Shalom? So it's Malik first. Malik first? Okay, come on, Malik. Who are you introducing, Malik? Oh, George Bonga. I just had to interrupt the classroom for my teacher telling the wrong story about Mr. Bonga. So come on here and tell us the right story, please. George Bonga was born in 1802. He was the first black person in the Northwest Territory, which later became the state of Minnesota. He was also a fur trader. He could carry up to 700 pounds of fur and supplies at once. He was also a translator of the Ojibwe language, Indian language. George Bonga died when he was 70 years old. Can you just click it when they just say that? Oh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's up next. Mm -hmm. Come on. Wait, hey, who are you introducing, Mom? Who are you introducing? Noah Stone Johnson. Oh, my hero. Come on up here. Come on up here. Center stage right here. Spit that. Nellie Stone Johnson was born in Dakota County, Minnesota in 1905. She was a civil rights activist and union organizer. She was the first black person elected to office in Minneapolis. She helped start the Democratic Party in Minnesota. There is a school in North Minneapolis named after her. She died in 2002. Thank you, Marley. That's another one I had to correct. The DFL had no idea who Nellie Stone Johnson was. I know. Go, oh my gosh, again. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They tried to tell me this guy was going to be the first black chair. I was like, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Um, so we got up next Alonzo. 
So check this out, Alonzo. I got the list, right? <laughs> you about to stump me. And I'm an African American studies major. I don't know Matthew Little. Oh. Educate me, young brother. Educate Matthew Little was a civil rights leader for over 60 years. He was the president for NAACP for 25 years. Him and Natalie Stone Johnson led the group from Minnesota all the way from March on Washington in 1963. Mr. Little was T.T. Lyle's Bidiaco's father. Thank you. Thank you, young scholar. All the way to Washington. Was that with the Ace of Fellow Randolph March? No, the 1963 with Josie Johnson. Oh. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that so much. You don't even know how much. So up next is Shalom. You're not going to stump me on this one, though. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. You ain't stumping me on this one. <laughs> Dr. Nakima Levy Armstrong was born in 1976. She's a leader who has been in the forefront in the fight against black people and justice and hold black abusers accountable. She's a lawyer, minister, law professor, and a writer. She is a national expert on issues of race, public policy, and the criminal justice system. She has a powerful voice for civil and human rights. Dr. Nakima Levy Armstrong is a freedom fighter, someone who we love, and a great example of black excellence. So I guess she did stop me. I thought she was introducing somebody else, but got me with Nakima. Okay, all right, I dig it. Um, so, I don't know who is here to introduce Ms. Johnson. Is that you? Savannah. Savannah. Uh -huh. Savannah. 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 Come on, Savannah. Now, you ain't going to stump me. Trust me on this. This was, this was my mentor's best friend. Tell me, I, I know about this lady right here. All right, here we go. We're going to put a chair. Yep, yeah, come on up the dog. She made all this Josie Johnson is my shero. She has been a civil rights activist since she was a teenager. She worked with her dad in Houston, Texas to get rid of the poll tax, which stopped black people from voting. She was vice president at the University of Minnesota, and she loves the event, so she comes and talks with us a lot. <laughs> <laughs> what we hope for. Amen. So to have this young, beautiful sister uh -huh. Uh -huh. identify me as one of her sheroes yes. is such an honor. So thank you. Would you like to sit down and have some words with us real quick? You want to sit right here? Okay. Well, it sort of depends on your program. We would, to, we, we would love to. We would love to give you a little for you to give us a little bit of wisdom for a couple of minutes. We're, they're coming. We got time, so <laughs> we have we have time. So here you can have a seat right here. I just want to ask a couple questions because I heard this story from a different perspective before. When uh, they were taking up the freeway 
in St. Paul, um, putting down the freeway and disrupting the Rondo community. I hear in the community that you were very active and there was a very interesting story that took place when you were young. Would you like to tell us about it? Let's see, it would kind of depend on which story. Uh -oh. <laughs> I like that, that's what I'm talking about. Um, I was more active in the disruption and re building of our community on the south side. What they did on, on the, uh, in the St. Paul, they were doing also on the south side. So it was the same intent, and that was to disrupt our community and to build the expressway there, which then opened the path for our other citizens to move out mm. of our communities, both in St. Paul and Minneapolis, into the suburban community. Resources were made available through federal funding to make that possible for other citizens to move to uh, other suburban communities outside of Minneapolis. So we were active, a lot of us, during that time in trying to communicate what that kind of, of uh, change would mean to our community. And as you know, in St. Paul, that historic development of Rondo, which was the community for us as a people in the whole state of Minnesota, and with all the creativity that was there, not only the creative talent of art and music and literature and uh, success in teaching, Katie McWatt's husband was a teacher in the St. Paul Public Schools, taught uh, history and wrote a wonderful book that you must look up sometime, my friends. And it was designed to identify black people in the Minneapolis and St. Paul communities and what was being done by them. Look it up. Arthur McWatt was the author. Katie McWatt was, I was so happy to hear the report about Katie. Katie, excuse me, Katie was the first black female in St. Paul who ran for city council. I never will forget my dear friend Katie standing in a hole that was dug to build a housing that she and others were working against. So we've had young people very active, aware black people in our two communities. We must continue to invite them to share their history. We're having to repeat so much of what our ancestors taught us. Pay attention, be alert, don't let your lack of information be proudful, because that's where you've come from. A community of proud, hardworking, mm -hmm. disciplined, creative, imaginative people. Learn about your people. Tell our children about your people, because we've got a lot to be proud of. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Yeah. Lady who, she was up. so sweet, she called me on the phone. We had a conversation. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Come on up. Come on up, TT. We're teaming this. Huh? These are your babies, huh? You, you're building these brilliant scholars right here. How you doing? Are you going to stomp me? Oh no, come on now, look, I'm trying to sneak a peek to see who it is. 
psych. I didn't get it. Oh, oh, you might. Okay, you you're not really stumping me, but it's okay. Come on. <laughs> Rita Clark King was born in 1936. She is a chemist and she was a vice president of the General Mills Corporation. Her father was a sharecropper and her and she was the former president of the General Mills Foundation. Her and her mother only had the third grade education. Wow. Wow. for an important question? Come on. Come on. Okay, so you were the president of General Mills. Foundation. Foundation. I'm sure there's a lot of people in here who are trying to navigate that system. Yes, yes. Can you just give us some words of advice on how we can best interrupt um, white supremacy to tap in and actually get resources to our communities? Can you give me a tip? I love to do that because all my 15 years as head of the General Mills Foundation, I was doing just that. Uh, when I went there, uh, a group of blacks came to me and said, we feel that the white arts organizations have access to the funding of the foundation more than black people, and we do not get considered. And I, I didn't debate it. I said, okay, let's work out a system and uh, change that. Change that perception and uh, make sure we're getting more money to black organizations. And we did just that. But what did I do first? I took the message to my power structure, the trustees of the foundation who were also the executives of the company. And I told them how we were perceived by the blacks in the community, uh, including in particular the number of theater, because they're in the art space. And uh, they weren't getting, I would say, their fair share either. So Lou Bellamy and several others uh, worked out a system that we called, and I want uh, Samaria uh, to hear this, we, we were creative. We designed a system called the Request for Proposals mm -hmm. wow. and invited requests from Native American organizations, African American, black organizations, uh, Southeast Asian organizations, Latino organizations. We reached out to them and said, submit proposals. And each submitted 16 excellent proposals, right. and we funded them. Uh -huh. uh, uh, one was Dartmouth College in, in uh, Hanover, New Hampshire. Why Dartmouth? Uh, the Native people, Native Americans, helped to found that prestigious Ivy League institutions. And uh, so, I went to the books, I learned a lot of history, but uh, I said all of this to let the young people know, uh, particularly these fourth graders. We have a lot of fourth graders amongst these. Uh, Zamariel is a fourth grader. Georgia, who introduced uh, Josie, is a fourth grader. No, uh, Savannah, Savannah. And she reminded me that my uncle calls me Savannah Georgia sometimes. Yeah. Uh, guess how much you remember when you make associations. Yeah, right. uh, that's right. and, but I'm from, a, I'm from South Georgia, so we, we became buddies right away. But I, I tell this story about problem solving because I was hired at General Mills and all of my leadership positions to solve problems, to be creative. 
And to do that, you've got to be confident. But first and foremost, I was proud of my people. Amen. And that's why I was able, able to talk truth to power mm. in terms of my trustees. I was proud of poorer people. There's some wealthy people at General Mills, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst them, the executives of the company. They're wealthy. Whether they understand poor people, I don't know. But I was there to help them learn. Right. And, uh, and I was the first representative of poor people. I was a cotton picker in South Amen. Georgia. My father was illiterate. He could not read and write. But he was a smart man. He was creative on the farm. He was inventive. Uh, if he didn't find a tool on the shelf, he could make it. So I told my grandchildren two years ago when I was getting an award, I said, you should always be aware that your good brains that got you into Princeton University came from your illiterate grandfather. Mm. Right. on that fancy stage, tears were running down my cheeks. And then, the, but the audience understood what I was saying. Those rich people jumped to their feet. I don't know whether they were drunk with champagne, <laughs> but they understood the point I was making. We too have too often been forced to underestimate the brilliance of us black people because of our skin color. Uh, and and then we lose confidence. Mm -hmm. Now, this program, I'm so proud of it because it's going to make Samaria confident. It's going to make Savannah confident. And she's agreeing over here. <laughs> and there's another fourth grader here. He had his hands up. It's going to make him confident. He came up to the stage. Whoever introduced uh, Nella Stone Johnson, you probably saw me saying yes indeed. She appointed me to be president of Metropolitan State University. She was, she was a member of the State University Board when I was appointed to that position where I served for 11 years. Uh, Nellie Stone Johnson is a bold woman, was a bold woman, a, a hero and a shero you can call her whatever you wanted to, but she got the job done. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so I, I just can't say enough about the beauty, the brilliance, and of our people. And now we are aiming to have them more courageous and to undo the doubts of because we were told that we were inferior for too long. <coughs> and uh, the, I, I'll stop there, but. Uh, my soul is just full of these stories mm -hmm. that got me through the, to where I am over the last 82 years. And I'm looking for a birthday card from all of us in here. <laughs> 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 uh, I'll give her the microphone. Thank you so much, Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark King. I appreciate you so much. So we have a poet coming up, Mr. Longshot. And then we're going to have an intermission right after that. I want to remind everybody to get some drinks at the bar. Um, and then make sure you come on back and get ready because we've got a full second half with Professor Mahmoud El Kanti. Ready? Hey! Hey! <laughs> How are you guys doing tonight? My name is Chet, AKA Longshot. I work for We Win, with We Win. Um, just a couple quick words. TT is, and um, man, she's so important in this community, a mentor to me. Um, I've learned so much about myself, my blackness, my history, about my people, just by being around you and working with We Win. So I wanna thank you very much. Um, and thank everybody for coming out and supporting us, our community, our kids, um, art, 
that's important. Um, the song I'm going to do right now, it's not even a song. It's a song, but I want to I wanna speak it to you because I feel like I always sing it. Um, it's the We Win Anthem, right? <clears throat> and I wrote it after speaking with my good friend, Josh, about the program. And he was just telling me about the program. He was like, it's called We Win. What does that mean? Just We Win. That's what TT named it. And so immediately I thought, what if it stood for We Work in the Neighborhood? Um, connect, that's what we do, right? Community work. So um, it goes like this. This is the chorus. <clears throat> We win when we don't give into the streets by selling drugs. We win when we don't kill our own, so go with pulling guns. We win when we have good parents that help us raise the young. Take a stand, be a man, be a woman. That's we win. First verse is this. He posted on the block, he got them rocks, he got that Glock, and yeah, he ready for whatever, even a shootout with the cops. But if they pop and then he drop, what's that? Another brother stop, that's how we losing. Stop abusing, choosing free instead of lock. Don't get me wrong, this just a song, but trust, there's truth within these bars. I told him, yeah, you got a gun, but show it, please shoot for the stars. That's how you'll make it, never fake it, cause this life is oh so precious. Like that movie, fight back truly, and don't give in to depression. See, knowledge is the key that opens doors. I'm hoping more, become more than what's expected. The best get off the floor and get to working for their dreams. Sometimes this life ain't what it seems, but no, he's only testing. Be sharp with your number two, never second guess it. Right? Because we win when we don't give in to the streets by selling drugs. We win when we don't kill our own, so come with pulling guns. We win when we have good parents that help us raise the young. Take a stand, be a man, be a woman. That's we win. Wow. Second verse is this. We working in the neighborhood. That's what we win should stand for. Hey girl, don't take a seat. And if you want it, you should stand, boy. Plan for it. Be prepared. Study for the test. Don't be scared. Ain't no guarantees for success. And I know that life ain't fair. But if you write with care and learn and grow to like it there, in school they make no fools. And those are the Jews that you should want to wear. No fronting here. We only gonna win when we get off our high. It starts with pride. I'm trying to shed some light. I know it's dark inside. Park the lies. Truthfully, we all gonna need each other at some point, so don't just point the finger. Build and help your brother. Together's the answer. When the question is, how do we rise? How many lives must expire before we cease fire tonight? Cause we win when we don't give in to the streets by selling drugs. We win when we don't kill our own, so come with pulling guns. We win when we have good parents that help us raise the young. Take a stand, be a man, be a woman. That's we win. Hey. Thank you, guys. intermission y'all please feel free get a stretch the bathrooms are downstairs um, have a drink and we'll be back in 10 minutes I'll say that again mm -hmm. I'm about to dance huh? you don't need Michaela Michaela where you at though <laughs> we do need Michaela Michaela where you at though okay there you go oh we really did need Michaela because she's on the drums Everybody give Michaela a round of applause. <laughs> she on the drums. All right, so we got our We Win youth here. What's your name, sister? Nyree. Nyree. Marley. And Marley. Marley shows up all the time. Wait a minute, are you the young sister that was here dancing last time? Have you been on this stage before? Yeah. My goodness, y'all are in for a beautiful show. Check this out. <laughs> My mo, my mo, my my
you are crazy with it. So we got Sanaya coming up next, right? We're gonna do a couple more. Let's bring them on up. Let's bring both of them up. Come on up, come on up. Are you gonna stop me? Are you about to stop me? Oh, no. Don't stop me now. I pride myself on my history. I was breaking it down. Go ahead, let's see. Sharon Sowers Billman was the first African American and first woman mayor of the city of Minneapolis. She was born in St. Paul, 1951. She continues to work for civil and human rights for black people and all humanity. Is it okay if I just stand right here? Okay, thank you. Listen, Tando Zulu is my favorite storyteller. She makes stories come alive. She has been telling stories about African people for more than 40 years. She created the Black Storyteller Alliance of Minnesota in 1991 with her husband. We love Miss Tando Zulu. for just a quick story. You got a quick story for us? You should just bless us with a quick story. It is Black History Month, Mazzulu. It's Black History Month. The quickest one I know is, is one of Nelson Mandela's favorite, but you know, it's, I, I, I don't always like to do it because of how it ends up, but you know, how it ends up is the truth, actually, I I, I would imagine. I, I, it, it, you tell me. Um, see, um, this is how the um, cat became a house cat. Because, you know, in the beginning, the cat was, a, 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 you know, a hunter, just like all the rest, you know, the panther and the lion and all of that. Uh, but she hunted with the jackal. So one day, while she's hunting with a jackal, I don't know what it was, but a lion got up on the wrong side of the bed, I guess, and he looked at jackal and went, pow! Knocked jackal out. Oh, no. So Cat said, mm, jackal is not the most powerful lion is. So then, Cat started hunting with lion, which was good. Lasted a long time because lion is a powerful hunter. Uh -huh. But lion is prone to listen to he said, she said uh -oh. stuff. Uh -oh. <laughs> and what happened was, a lion heard from the monkey that the elephant had been talking about his mama and his grandmama. Lion got mad, went and confronted the elephant. And of course the elephant whipped that lion. Now, so, so you know, Cat said, oh well now, a lion is not the most powerful elephant is. And she began to hunt with elephant, which was great, because now, She's sitting up way up high, you know, like like in one of them Humvees or you know, one of them big things they folks drive. <laughs> anyway, so and, and she became a vegan. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah, okay. Anyway, so that lasted a real long time. <laughs> but one day as they were they were hunting, you know, her friend the elephant, you know, fell and and, and almost crushed her with the head. And, she tried to wake her friend up, and the only thing that she saw was that her friend wouldn't get up, and her eyes were closed, and the only thing she could see was a, a man, you know, two-legged animal, standing there with a long rod, and the smoke was coming out of the end. So she said, ah, elephant is not the most powerful man is, and she followed him home, but she didn't go into his house. No, she went up on his roof because the roof was made of hay, and if you know anything about hay, it's nice and warm. Uh -huh. And lots of mice hang out in the hay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where she hung out. But one day while she was hanging out in that hay, 
she heard a commotion inside of the house. And it was a man and woman's voice raised. So she thought she leaned over the roof to see what was going on. About that time, man came rolling out of the doorway. And woman was standing in the doorway with her hand on her hip, yeah. pointing her finger at the man and telling him, you ain't, you ain't coming back in here until you know how to talk to me. <laughs> so the cat came down off the roof. She said, mm. Man is not the most powerful. <laughs> oh my goodness. Step, give her a round of applause. And that is why that young sister honored this woman today because she is so amazing. Her stories are so engaging and they're full of so much wisdom and knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, we're getting to the brunt of this uh, story here. We're getting to the brunt of this program, right? There's no way you're going to stop me, young brother. See, I know this guy right here. I know, I know this guy. You ready? It's the guy of the hour. You ready? <laughs> Mahmoud al Kati writes books on the African American experience. He was one of the first black professors at the University of, of Minnesota. He also taught at McAllister College. He, he has a show on Camel J radio station. He is the one who our people go to to learn about black culture. <laughs> Professor, could you please join us on stage? I would like the young generation to stay on stage with him, but I do want to ask some, um, how did you get started? What turned the light bulb on that made you start to dig in? Because you're so knowledgeable about even Pan-Africanism, going all the way back to the colonies, um, to the present and understanding. So what turned that light bulb on? Honest, honest. I wish I knew. But, uh, let me, before, before we get into anything, I want to first hail and salute Tidilai Biyako. because this is very important for everybody to understand and for human beings, period, the whole human family, but expressly for people and the condition of African Americans in the United States of America. And this is because <clears throat> we are a part of the oppressed family and humanity. African people, black people don't like it, and certainly your president doesn't like it. 
people like me to talk this way, but the fact of the matter is the most important thing for us is freedom, yes. dignity, mm -hmm. respect for human personality. That's the most important thing. It's not affirmative action. It's not set aside program. <laughs> it's not having the top job at some corporate um, entity. He said we are human beings Amen. and we deserve dignity and respect like all other human beings. And that's what the fight is about. It's not a fight about anything else in this country, in the Western world, is whether or not black people, African descended people in the world, are fully fleshed human beings in the eyes of most white people. I say no, and that is the problem. There never has been, is now, never will be a Negro problem in America, a black problem. The problem is white people. That doesn't mean I hate white people, I'm anti-white. Anybody who has a modicum of understanding of human history knows that. This is new. This is a time when there were no white people calling themselves white people. That's an invention. There was no time when black people anywhere in Africa, anywhere else, were calling themselves Negroes. That's an invention. That's a modern racist construction what came into being about four or five hundred years ago, I'll, I'll lose, use Columbus. Y'all have heard of him, right? <laughs> he discovered America when I was in second grade. He <laughs> sailed the ocean blue and all of that. You know, that's a myth. He never set foot in America. Now, if any class you go to, you tell the teacher, I told you to say that. <laughs> that's not true, that's a myth. A myth is not an outright lie. I didn't know he was in the Caribbean, he was in Cuba, he was in Haiti, he was in. There. But he never set foot on the mainland of America. That's not why it's called Columbus. It's called Amerigo Vespucci, the other guy. And Vespucci was an explorer like Columbus, and he was from the the Latin countries and 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 and, and they anglicized that they make another word English. Amerigo Vespucci, Amerigo became America in English. See, that's how myths are made. And this is what we want. I think that black people, as I understand the story of black people's struggle for freedom, it is not to pounce upon, it is not to oppress any segment of the human family. We want to be free from all the madnesses that America is, and it's a child of the Western world. Racism wasn't born in America. Get that out of your head. It was brought here. Mm -hmm. It was brought here by English-speaking people, Spanish-speaking people, Portuguese-speaking people, to a lesser extent, people who spoke Dutch. All this is becoming clearer now, and I'm saying all this to say that, I'm, and I'm glad the, the audience is integrated. By that I mean intergenerational. <laughs> it's integrated. Like the old, the old one room schoolhouse. <laughs> you, remember? you can learn together intergenerationally. You know, you can explain what I'm sure some of the children don't, don't understand what I'm talking about. That's your job, dad, cousin, Bill, uncle, to have this conversation with your child. That's the way many of us learn. I had conversations with my grandmother after church. Explain what this means, what that means. See, that's another way of learning. There's more than one way to learn. There's more than one way to skin a cat, too. <laughs> well, I, I want to salute these beautiful people who are doing the right thing. And in so far as our struggle are concerned, is concerned, the most important things about human beings, and I'm always, I'm talking about the human family. I, can, I insist that I'm a human being, no matter what the definition of, of uh, racism has been coming up with since, uh, since de Comte de Gouverneur. You say, well, who the hell is that? <laughs> well, he's a, he's, he helped 
write the book on racism. He wrote a book called The Inequality of Races. And he wasn't talking about black people, he was talking about white people, people we call white. He was talking about the Nordic people being superior to the, uh, the uh, Mediterranean people, like darker white people in the Mediterranean, Italian, Jews, like that. He wasn't talking about uh, uh, English people who are blonde-headed or brown-headed. He's talking about something called Nordic, which gave us Hitler. You understand? This idea of race has been around a long time. Racism, ISM, which gives us action, has been around for about three or four hundred years. The action, the segregation, you know what that is? Racial slavery, you know what that is? Okay. Now, that's the ism. But everything in this world comes from ideas. And race is an idea which was actualized through the period of exploration, imperialism, colonization, and racial slavery. Racial slavery is new in the world. There's nothing new about slavery when the world was young. Slavery was old. <laughs> there was slavery in Europe, in Egypt. There was slavery in China. There was slavery in India. Nothing, you know, people exploiting the labor of other people. <laughs> and slavery was governed primarily by the rules of war, not race. Mm -hmm. right. What we call slavery shouldn't be called slavery. Mm -hmm. it's a, you know, because we don't have the right word for it. Um, it's, it's been fixed by the experience of the West and black people. When people think of slavery, they think of black people because it's so recent in history. <laughs> you know, slaves were in Egypt. Jews were slaves. <laughs> Many, almost everybody you can name has a background in what might be called slavery. So black people stop being ashamed and hiding from that. That's right. Amen. Right. White people stop that foolishness. <laughs> you know, and it is foolish. You know, understand what uh, Ralph Ellison taught us, the man who wrote one of the great books of the 20th century, Invisible Man when he discovered who he really was. He said, I'm no longer ashamed that my ancestors were slaves. I'm only ashamed of having once been ashamed when I found out who I really was. <laughs> you understand? That I'm ashamed. These, these are magnificent human beings. Not better, but different. Black people are different. Don't go around here borrowing pages from white books saying you're better than somebody because you can do this better or that better. You're not better. You're different. Yeah, right. And history made you different and accept it, embrace it, yeah. and make something out of it. Yeah. Everybody wants to be something better than they are at the moment. And that's what we're trying to teach the world. We want to make this a better country. That's the story of black people in America. Any gain for black people is a gain for everybody. Yeah. If you don't know that, you don't know anything about America. You don't know. If you don't know that, now I'll say this for the children. This is the 96th anniversary of the observance of African American History Month. Wow. wow. Been doing it for 96 years. Wow. Almost as old as I am. <laughs> uh, we've been doing this a long time. And we have to thank for this Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I want all the young people to say this after me. Carter, Carter G. G. Woodson. Woodson. I should have said the old people too. Carter, Carter G. G. Woodson. Woodson. That was a human being. A man like you with a beating heart and living affections who created this observance. That's right. It didn't come out of the sky. It has nothing to do with uh, picking a cold month in February for black people. <laughs> it's nothing to do with it. that's, that's nonsense. It's a human being who lived on this earth for 75 years from 1875 until 1950. And he put 
most of his conscious life to studying black people all over the world. He taught for about 10 years in the Philippines. He lived in Asia. He went to China. He went to Central America. He went to South America. He wrote 23 books you know, on black people. And the most important one that you know of, or you should know of, is what called, it's called the Miseducation of the What? Yeah. Of the Negro, thank God, I think it is. He wrote that book in, 30, in, in 1935. It's more widespread now than ever. But he wrote a book prior to that, 20 years before that, called The Education of the Negro. <laughs> Education is the word which means, it comes from the Greeks. What well, didn't come from the Greeks? <laughs> but, uh, and it's the age you say, meaning to lead oneself out of ignorance. That's what education means. You don't have to go to school to educate yourself. <laughs> but, okay, you, know, you understand? Frederick Douglass never spent a day in school, except to go to address the graduating class. He never had formal education. So you wonder how he spoke fluently four different languages. You, he's a slave, as he said. I was a commercial, I was a piece of property until I was 20 years old and took my freedom. Nobody gave you freedom, you take your freedom. Um, and he and so many other black people have done that. So we are, this is what, 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 uh, what, uh, what uh, Ellison was talking about. I'm proud that I'm a descendant of these people who the world or the oppressor defined as three-fifths of other persons. Part of me supposed to have been property and part of me supposed to have been human. You all know where that came from? The First Amendment in the American Constitution. It's in the Constitution that these guys in Washington are talking about. We were the ones defined as three-fifths of other persons legally. That means you were property in the eyes of the oppressor and not fully fleshed human beings. We gotta put that on the table right now during the Trump era. Put it on the table. All of these things that people are ducking and dodging around. Trump inadvertently, I know you're not gonna agree with me, is doing us a favor by reviving white supremacy. Yeah, because that's what it is. It's not racism. By racism, I mean white supremacy. And white supremacy is a doctrine that evolved and was created by modern Western Europeans, by Frenchmen, by Englishmen, by Germans, not all white people. People in Eastern Europe, it had nothing to do with this. It's the, it's the 15 countries of Western Europe. That's why Europe is so what? rich in Africa so poor. And the development of Europe uh, made Africa poor. How uh, Rodney, uh, Walter Rodney, a great black scholar, wrote the book of how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Before Columbus, they were about even in development and growth and civilization was Africa. After slavery began the Atlantic slave trade, that's when the wealth of Africa belonged to Europe. Came to you. What do you mean by wealth? Wealth comes from labor. You can't have wealth without labor. The source of all wealth is labor. Everything in this room you see comes from some labor. Not the way we labor now because you had technological revolution and so machines replaced black people. That's the industrial revolution. <laughs> we stimulated the industrial revolution. If you were living in the South at the time of the Civil War, this, look, I'm no genius, a deep cat, you know, I mean, I'm just like anybody else, you know. And I got trapped by the freedom blood, freedom bug when I was very young. That's what, that's it, you know, at different stages. You know, some people get it when they're 16, they're 15, they go to college and sometimes they earn degrees and then they get it. But I got it from my grandmama. All right. All right. That's where the freedom book comes from. <laughs> Teaching me to read before going to school. All right. All right. Oh, uh, half of my education is owed to black newspapers. 
I've been reading them since I was five years old. That's, I have no degree in that. <laughs> There's no degree. <laughs> Unless my grandma would give, give me the degree, but that's nonsense. We can educate ourselves. That's what Nakima is doing. That's what Titi Lai Bidiaku is doing. And how do you do that? By building institutions. Institutions are enduring processes. Can I prove it? Yes, I can. My, I've spent most of my life in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And, you know, think what you will of me. That's where I've been. <laughs> most, I'm a southern boy and so forth. Left when I was 17 and all of that, you know. Saw a little bit of the world before I came here. Uh, but education had to be, has to be self induced too. We can educate ourselves. If it means leaving yourself out of ignorance, we can do that. We've done some of that since the 1960s. You know, the 1960s is, is the most credible decade of the 19th, of the 20th century. It is remarkable. Black people don't seem to know what they have done for themselves and for this country. The decade of the 60s was the culmination of something, the unfinished work of the Civil War and the failure of Reconstruction. This is a, the, the, the Civil Rights Movement is rooted in the failure of Reconstruction. That's a period in which black people were free for a, you know, a little while, you know, 10, 12, 15 years, and it was taken away from us. Uh, there was one time we voted. I mean, black males voted, not women at all. See, this is a male chauvinist society. We just discovered it 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, black men got to vote for white women. And 18, um, 1870, that's how long we were supposed to vote. And when the black people got to vote, the black men vote, they did. They elected over 2,000 black people to public office. There were senators from Mississippi, believe that. You understand? There were 20 black people. At one point in American history, South Carolina had a state legislature, was majority black. Yeah. And uh, they're the ones who brought public school system to the South. The black legislators. <laughs> they passed the legislation. They're the ones that gave white women the right to own property. Black legislators. You never heard of them. <laughs> but they were men who lived. And one of them replaced the president of the Confederacy. Amen. You, Amen. you know, all this is, this ain't super secret mock move <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Anybody can know this. <laughs> Anybody, he can. Yeah. Now he does. That's right. No, 80% of what I'm talking about. If he's exposed to it. Right. That's all. There's no such thing as achievement gap. Get that out of your head. When some of us are coming along, they always put a trick on it. has to do with the notion that black people are inherently less intelligent than white people. That's a profound belief. You can and it's in some of our heads. Amen. There's some black people who actually believe the white people are smarter than them because they're white. <laughs> you may be smarter than me, but it ain't because you're white. <laughs> you have some individual gifts. God gives us individual. Our population is like any other population in the world. There's a genius over here and an idiot over there. Most of the ordinary people. That's who, that's who we are. And we have geniuses. Our genius has been suppressed. You know, whites has been elevated. They ain't got nothing to do with you, you, are, you having less pigment than me in your skin that makes you smarter than me. We got to attack that. Yes. That's, right. That's the ideology of what? No, don't say complain. Who you in Attack it. No, you ain't. Jimmy Baldwin, who I think is morally the bravest man of my time. Yeah, I know Martin was there. But he said it right. right. You know, I don't want to be white. All right. I want to grow up. <laughs> and so should you. 
He said, no, all white audience, and so should you. <laughs> That's crazy. Now, he was a near genius, and he discovered he was smart when he was very young. He was smarter than most people. That's not a good thing if you're black and smart and young. That's not necessarily a good thing. You up, you up against the wall. When you're smart and young and you discover that you're smart, you going to catch some hell from somebody. And some of your old black people don't believe it. How, is it so, how come he's so smart, you know? Yeah, because God gave that to him. Nature gave that to him. You know, it's, it's nothing wrong with the skin color. This is a genius as individual. Let me, I went farther than I wanted to. So now you can see why we need to have Mahmoud El Khati in the curriculum in Minnesota schools. This is what we're pushing for. We need to call superintendents of Minneapolis, St. Paul, everywhere. We deserve it. We need to learn. We need to know. And let me just say that Mahmoud is part of a collaboration in terms of this new book towards an African education. Yes. Mahmoud, will you talk about this a little bit? Thank you. Almost forgot about the book. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, you know, let me say this, institutions. This can become an institution. Right. You say, what is an institution? Don't go fancy with me. <laughs> An institution is enduring is an enduring process. It is a process, whatever the process is. You know, it can be medicine, it can be education, it can be theater, it can be anything, something that endures. You're not here today and going tomorrow. We went institute, I'm proclaiming, and you will hear this shortly in, in the future, is an institution. Because right. it's 23 years old. You say, well, wait a minute now. Because when I came into the world, people used to say generations were every 30 years. And then they cut it down after World War II. <laughs> uh, uh, 25 years. <laughs> now here's where you, you really, black people should stand up and do the definitions. One of the things about is, is freedom is self-definition. You should find yourself and other things around you. I say an institution, given the fact that the time span, what we call time, has sped up since World War II, I say institutions in our community, by our time, because it is just 20 years. All right. All right. This institution is 23 years old. Uh -huh. This right. Seed Academy is up. Seed Academy is over 30 years old. I met a graduate of Seed who just graduated from college about three weeks ago. <laughs> You know, OIC is an institution. Yeah. Sabathony, that's where I taught some of the first classes I ever taught was in a little house next to Sabathony Church. That's almost 40 years ago. <laughs> that's an institution. Yeah. And I've counted 25 institutions that have been built in this community since I've been here. Wow. You know them, but you don't call them institutions. We got to proclaim that. This is an institution because it is trained over a generation of our children. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Some of you, you have children here, some of you. You know, and we support that. I'm for anything having a deal with children. Because that's the only, don't tell anybody, I told you this. <laughs> that's the only wealth you really have. Or your youth, or your young human beings are well. The Cadillac ain't wealth. That's the thing that comes, it goes. A telephone, it's, it's human beings. Well, it's human beings make Cadillacs, make this stuff here. That's the only wealth. I learned that from an African leader by the name of Julius Nareli of Tanzania. He said, no, I ain't going for it. <laughs> I'm going to develop people. I don't want baby skyscrapers and traffic jams like the Western African country. I want to develop human beings. That's what development means to me. Illiterate 
population. A population that can feed itself. Yeah. A population of skilled workers. That's wealth. Not a Cadillac, sorry. <laughs> so, well, you know, it'll tear up and, and so forth. The only, I'm not the only one that knows this. You know, as dumb as he is, the president knows this. <laughs> and, or as dumb as he acts, I don't know. <laughs> he knows that. <laughs> That's what the fear is, that you're going to develop your children strong, resilient, smart, life-making human beings. That's the fear. That's why the man shoots a child 18 times, dead before he hits the ground. That's the fear is of young black men and young black women. That's really what it's all about, y'all. Don't let anybody kid you. It ain't about... I don't like white folk. Come on with that nonsense. <laughs> it ain't about white folk. As people, it's the deed. <laughs> the judgment is on the deed. Stop the deed. <laughs> and it's over. Stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> Through what? How do you do it? Through your institutions. Yeah. All American institutions are based on the doctrine of white supremacy, all of them. Yeah. Now go get any professor you want from anywhere, Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Let's have it out. <laughs> Let's have it out, right? That's, have, that's what that's about. Institutions are uh, instruments of oppression all over the world. It's in Africa, it's in Asia. You know, you had institutions oppress people. That's what it, what's an institution? Big an, an army. <laughs> What's an institution? A government. What's an institution? A religious organization. What's an institution? An educational organization. What's an institution? An economic organization. Banks and so forth. Those are institutions. They're not individuals. Individuals run them, but they have policies and programs that control people's life and make people's behavior predictable. That's why some of us, somebody alluded to self-hate. That's where that comes from. You think it's wrong to be black <laughs> because the institutions teach you that. White people are norm and blacks are the ab abnormal. Oh, to the less extent, Native Americans too. I, oh, I've got to say this and then I'll quit. <laughs> no, no, because I know a lot of people are not down for this kind of stuff and I understand what? that. No, they're down for it. That's why they're here, they're down for it. Okay, I, I just. Listen. Look, <laughs> the stuff is, man, y'all got to, these people who shaped my life, y'all got to, you beginning with my grandmother and John Henry Clark and all the two boys and all of, you know, some of them, they, they shaped my life, you know, in the midst of all this madness. Uh, somehow they got through to me. Somehow they got through to me. I'm no different from any brother who been down the line. It's just... Uh, it's an accident. I mean, it's, it's just, I'm supposed to be in a statistic easily. I know I, I, that I'm aware of, I'm supposed to be dead three times. But, yeah, but at the hands of policemen, I'm supposed to be dead. Well, well. Sure. And, and I, I mean, it's so obvious with hindsight that there's so, I'm no different. I got through the crack because I encountered uh, people. And, and uh, I come from my education, and that it is, is to the extent that I have any, okay, is that it's organic. No school is responsible for that. I'm proud to say, you know, it's sound twisted, that I've never taken but one formal course in African American history. <laughs> never. And that was only because I went to a historically black school called Wilberforce University. Hey. And those proud AMEs, you know what you did? You couldn't get out of the damn school unless you took two courses. Run. You, I don't care if you're a straight A student. I don't care if you've not been on the dean's list too. I don't care how many times you've been on the dean's list. You gotta know who you are. And it was required. You couldn't graduate. That's those are the only formal place places. The others come from the various scholars around this country, you know, John Clark, John Jackson, Ben Yusef Jackson, I used to follow those men around. 
I go 500 miles here from Chicago to hear John Clark lecture. I, when I go to New York, I go to his, he had one of the big brown stones, you know, truly, some of the best architect ever in New York. He bought one. His library had 10,000 books in it. And he would sit down there and talk to him and I'd tape him and listen to him. He's been to this town at least a dozen times. How do you know that? Because I brought him here. <laughs> he used to be here all over the place. He used to come to the way. Y'all, anybody know the way? Yeah. That's where my career started. Not at the university. On the street <laughs> with some young brothers on the prison merry-go-round. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, and people ask me, what, what did you come over here? You had a nice little job. Somebody know. He's a psychological counselor. Oh, it was a white man put on me. I wasn't, I didn't earn that. He, he just gave me a title. See, so they needed a token Negro, so they got me. They, you, you got a title, you know. But when that thing, when Syl Davis approached me and said, we're trying to build a different kind of institution, not a settlement house, but we want to be a part of the movement. Would you join me if I get this thing off the ground? Yes. And I say, yeah, I can't wait. What, what, what do you, you know, what, and people say, why are you, you left this good little middle class job, yeah, you know, on the way to a PhD and all of that. You know. Listen, I'm telling you, the people make me who I am. I know where I belong. I, I, don't, I didn't belong at the University of Chicago where I was accepted. <laughs> I belonged over here. In North Minneapolis, I'm a St. Paulite. <laughs> this is what they, that's, that's where the bad people are. They get bad. They, they get rockers over there, and they talking about politics. Over there. Hell, that's where I want to be. That's where, I, <laughs> and that's why people on who know me real well, except my dear friends, don't even know that I've lived in St. Paul for 50 years. They think I live in North Minneapolis. <laughs> anyway, I go in the grocery store, I'm a nice shopper at the grocery store, and I'm down there shopping and so forth. See a brother or sister from Minneapolis, 10 o'clock at night, and they look, what are you doing over here? <laughs> no, no, I should be asking you that. I live in St. Paul. But my, I, I mean, I, 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 I spend my life in Minneapolis, but I sleep, and my family is in St. Paul. It's not in Minneapolis, see? Because that's what the movement will do for you. It will snatch you, buddy, <laughs> and won't let you go. And say, I want to be where the action is because I came here from Cleveland, from Huff area. That's the roughest, toughest area in Cleveland. That's where the, the thing went up, the rebellion <laughs> was said. I worked there. So it was North Minneapolis resembled Huff to me. Well, that's where them bad Negroes are. Well, I want to be over there. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I know if you say they bad, you know, they can't be that bad. If the established order calling people criminals and people who want to help people in prison programs say we were coddling criminals, you're a criminal. Well, let, let, we got to turn this thing upside down. We're not the criminals. We are the pace setters for human freedom. We are the, we are that moral arc that, that Dr. King talked about, the moral arc of the university is long, but it bends toward freedom. That's where we are. You know, I'm not gonna fall. I'm not, yeah, no, no, I'm not leaving. But I, I wanna just say something for the children. Well, I hope you are, and I hope I didn't, bore you children. I know I got some great children stories. You know, that's another story. But, but this, is, this is a mixed audience, uh, you know, generationally. You don't get it. I want you to repeat up after me some of some great words from our forefathers. These are words to live by. These are the things that inspired these people like Josie and so many others that you picked out. This is what cause them to do what they do. I want you to repeat some of it after me. Here we are. Here we are. And here we are likely to be. To imagine that we shall be eradicated. 
is absurd, is absurd. And, ridiculous. and ridiculous. We can be changed. We can be modified, we can be modified or, even or even assimilated, but never extinguished. But never extinguished. We therefore repeat we never that, we that we are here, that this is our country too. Is our country too. We shall neither die out, shall nor, die shall die out. Shall nor shall we be driven away, but we shall go with this people, so we shall go with either as a testimony against them. Or as an evidence in their favor throughout their generation. That's Frederick Douglass taught us that. Our country. And I don't mean to dismiss and disrespect the indigenous people. They're the original landlords. That's right. They were here thousands of years before Africans or white people showed up. But I ain't gonna let no white man. Look at me as if I just showed up. Right. 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 Drove up. You know, after the Civil War, most white people couldn't date back like I'm a, from a slave family. You know, you know, we didn't have uh, birth certificates and so forth. But I can date back clearly in my family, on my mother's father's side, seven generations. Wow. The average white man can't do that. Wow. <laughs> they know that. Mm -hmm. The people in think tanks know that. The government knows that. The, the, the oldest population next to the indigenous people are African people. Right. They've been here long gone. We've been here for 14 generations. Oh, wow. Why people can't say that? So what do you mean? What are you doing in this neighborhood? You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you ought to be upset. <laughs> what, you, what are you asking me? What I'm doing here? What you, I was here when you got here. Right. You the one that just drove up. I didn't just drive up in right. into a ghetto. I didn't come in any, out of any ghetto. I came. Most of my life has been sent, spent in the farm, in the yeah, rural, right. growing right. and raising right. things, right. Right. and so forth. Just like a Minnesota farmer, yeah. we built Charleston. Which was once the largest city in America. Charleston, South Carolina, was once the largest city in America. People who built it were black labor. That's who built that sucker. You know, all these people at Wall Street built by black people. That's what, what do you think those thousand grave sites came from downtown about 20 years ago when they discovered the chain of black slaves? Over a thousand. Lastly, I'm getting the signal. Uh, lastly, <laughs> I want y'all to go down with me on this one. Because I'm oh, great. We're so wise. God. Frederick Douglass was so wise. He was a major leader of two movements. Abolitionists for the freedom of black people. And he was a political feminist. Uh -huh. See, the male, I'm a political feminist. You don't have to be a female to be a feminist. That's a political construct. I'm a feminist, you know. I don't have to be built a certain way. You know, this is about freedom and justice and equality and respect for human personality. Douglas understood that. And so he said, truth is, is of no color. Right? is of no sex. You wanna get that? Truth is of no color. Right is of no sex. That was on his masthead of the newspaper. He led two movements. The last people he addressed, his last public speech, was to white women and Washington, D.C. He died the next morning. I'm saying that for some, you know, People who think they're feminists, <laughs> but don't bring up Frederick Douglass' name. But you go, if you go to New York, they, they have what? 
Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, um, what's the other, big three, and Frederick Douglass, there's statues to four, four of them. Go to New York, to um, Seneca Falls. That's where, that's where the women's rights movement started. He was the black male who addressed the audience. Don't tell me about us. We're transcendent people. We ain't about no race. We're about transcending race. We're about, we're human-centric people. We're not, you get it? Amen, amen. We're not about the race thing. The only reason why we even call our race ourselves race is because white people impose that on you. The only reason why you call yourself a Negro is because they impose that innocent, yes, Spanish word, simply means an adjective, meaning, meaning black, like these pants. That's a common name in the Portuguese and Spanish language. Del Negro River, the second biggest river in Brazil. It's a common word, and they borrowed the word from the Spanish because the Spanish and the Portuguese and West Africans go way back before Columbus. Way back. Repeat after me. All of us. And no, no, let, no, let the children do this. Can you do this with me? All right, here we go. The whole, the whole history, history of the struggle for freedom, of the struggle for freedom has, been born has been born of earnest, of earnest struggle. struggle. The conflict, the conflict must be exciting, must be exciting, agitating, agitating and all absorbing. And all absorbing. <laughs> For the time being, For the time being, putting all of the tumults, all tumults to, silence. to silence. It must do this, it must do this or it does nothing. Or it does nothing. For if there is no struggle, there is no progress. There is no progress. Men and women. Men and women. Who want to struggle without freedom. Who want to struggle without freedom. They want to reign. They want to reign. Without thunder and lightning. Without thunder and lightning. They want the oceans. <laughs> without the awful roar of his mighty waters. Without the awful roar of his mighty waters. The struggle may be a moral one. Or it may be a physical one. Or it may be a physical but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. So then, so then, black men and women, black men and women will be held at the north, hunted and flogged at the south. <laughs> so long as they submit to these devilish outrages, either moral or physical, men and women may not get all that they pay for in this world. Or in this world. But they sure as hell must pay. <laughs> but they sure as hell must pay. For all the digging. Okay. 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 I'm going to ask T.T. to come on up right quick. As I said before, Professor has been part of my life. And I'm going to give T.T. a moment to say how he's impacted her, her life, too, because I know that he has. I did leave off the KMOJ listening time I've put in in my elderly years here, <laughs> too. But um, you want to come up, T.T.? Um, I, I am so honored to be on the stage of Mahmoud El Kati. Um, he's meant a lot in my life, a lot in my family's life. As a matter of fact, uh, when my father died, 
Mahmoud was right there and he eulogized my dad. And he loves black people more than anyone I know. And on behalf of Asada Speaks, on behalf of the black community, on behalf of Chantel. <laughs> We, we can't hear you, Chantel. We want, we want the honor of presenting you with this award, sir. I want to thank you so much for all that you've brought to our community. Um, also, I remember I was in the tea house one time, and I had on a Katie McGuire shirt, and he, he was appreciating that, and I asked permission if we could, if I could start a line of our community leaders, and so one of my designers made this shirt for and I wanted to give it to you today. Um, I will be having my own Professor Mahmoud El Khati shirt also that I'll be wearing in the community to remind people of who is carrying us. Thank you. So also. Uh, can you hold this up the camera? People want to see what you got here. There's the award. What does it say, Chantel? So I'm going to read it real quick. Mahmoud El Akati, historian, after, Af African guru, freedom fighter, revolutionary. This award is presented on behalf of the community Thursday, February 27, 2020, at Asada Speaks. Thank you for your undying love and for being unapologetically black. Thank you. I, I'm mystified by something. How did you all make these pictures of me look so good? <laughs> <laughs> we have an amazing designer, Amelia, in the back. She's yes. amazing yeah. with Woo! these designs. Also, um, because I know that uh, Miss McGuat was really good friends with you, Dr. Jossie, this is very similar to the shirt that I wear when I protest because I carry her spirit with me when I'm shutting down freeways, laying in the middle of the street, all of that, and so I wanted to present this to you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Give a round of applause to all of our great elders that were here giving us all this beautiful wisdom today. Um, we're going to have a, Nikima Marquise come on up on stage. Thank she, And Malachi, also Malachi, come on up here. Um, I want to thank Nikima. Y'all know she's a perfectionist. Who knows Nikima's a perfectionist? Who knows that I have ADHD? Who knows that I'm all over the place when it comes to kids. I'll just get a mic to the kids, let them loose and do all kind of stuff. Nakima actually trusted me to do this today. That's amazing. She's lucky Asada wasn't here. <laughs> so Malachi is going to give us one more piece and then we're going to do the Asada chant and we're going to head on out of here. Uh, first I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you to all the legendary leaders who are here today. You guys are truly inspiring. Uh, and Mr. Joseph Jackson, you almost made me cry during the intermission. Um, uh, these stories of resilience have been bold uh, and beautiful, and we will do our best uh, 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 to, uh, to make you proud of what we continue to do with your legacy. Before I do this poem, I do want to give myself one plug. Last week, I had a podcast that premiered with uh, another colleague of mine, where we go around interviewing other clergy uh, in the Minneapolis area. Uh, the second episode debuted today. It's called Connectional. You can find it on Google Podcasts, and I'll put the links uh, on the Facebook page for the event so you guys can check it out. All right. I'm learning from Nakima telling me that I got to plug myself. <laughs> All right, this poem is shorter than the one before. I was named after a man named Malcolm. I should have known the world would call me reckless. They say you live like you have nothing to lose, but I live like I have everything to lose because everything is always on the line for us. 
This game was not made for us, but we still win sometimes. And even when they beat us, they still want to be us. Their children wear our clothes and speak our tongue. So when it's all said and done, there's nothing better than being black. Thank you, Thank you Malachi. Thank you. All right, Nakima, come on, Marquise, come on up here. Let's close this on out, Professor. We do the solid chant at the end of this. So everyone, please stand. Please stand. We want to thank you all for being here tonight. I don't know if y'all know, but Marquise and I literally jumped off a plane. We were in Brazil for a full week, and we ran to a side of speech. So we're like, we cannot miss this for the world. Uh, knowing that Professor Okadi was going to be here sharing his wisdom tonight, knowing that Dr. Josie Johnson was going to be here as well, Dr. Rita Clark King, and our children, of course, from We Win Institute. We're like, we got to come to a side of speaks and we're thankful that you all made it a priority to be here tonight. We're thankful for our wonderful co-hosts, Chantel <laughs> Allen and TT Bidiaco. They put this whole program together so we could actually enjoy our time away. We're just so thankful and so blessed. Did you guys enjoy tonight's show? Yes. So carry all that wisdom, that knowledge, and that energy forward because even though we celebrate Black History Month for all of us is 365 days a year. So she's not lying about how suddenly they just were able to make it here in time because originally it was, I don't think I'm going to make it at all. And then, she, then it was Professor Within Jossie that all of a sudden was like, I think I might be able to make it there. And then they were here before it even started. So By the grace of God. By the grace of God, but they were on a mission. They knew this was going to be a beautiful show. So Absolutely. thank you all again. Um, thank just, you to DJ Supreme as oh, well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Always, the bartenders, our bartenders, our host, everybody who was a part of the show, Pastor Malachi as well, Shavonda who came and sang in the beginning. We are grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. King Demetrius and Nico for documenting this. Always. We have to celebrate you guys. It takes a lot of people to have a wonderful show. Oh, yeah. And Amelia for all the beautiful things that you put together for Professor El Cotti. So with that, just sorry. repeat after me. Let's just get to it. So we have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to win. We have a duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. Because we have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to win. We have a duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. Because we have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have a duty to win. We have a duty to win. We must love and support one another. Because we have nothing to lose but our chains. 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 All power to the people, y'all. All power to the people. Thank you guys so much. This was beautiful. The fourth Thursday of every month, right here. Absolutely. Thank you. Take it away, Supreme.